Thank you, Jordan. On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I'm Sedge Deans, the trustee of the council and your moderator this evening. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guest. Dr. Admati is the George Parker Professor of Finance and Economics at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. Since 2010, she has been active in the policy debate on financial and capital regulations. Professor Admati received her BS from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and her MA, MPhil, and PhD from Yale University. She is a fellow of the Econometric Society and serves on the FDIC Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee. Here to speak with us about how to create an, a healthier banking system, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Anat Admati. Thank you, thank you all for coming and thank you for having me here, uh, everybody. So uh, the book which uh, is here uh, and which I hope you will read, uh, I want to tell you a little bit first about why uh, I wrote this book and how I came to uh, live in the bunker for a year and a half uh, trying to do this book, which seemed impossible at times. Um, after the financial crisis, I became interested in why we had this crisis and whether there was uh, anything to do about it. And I started reading a lot of what was being said and also listening to what, what was uh, being said. In the process, uh, I became a little concerned about what people were saying and also about what people were not saying and uh, started asking questions about both parts. Why? this was being said and why other things were not being said that I seemed like they should be said. And um, eventually, the more I looked, you can imagine me in the ivory towers, high floor. Uh, I was a theorist thinking about uh, corporate governance issues and writing little models uh, about that um, and teaching um, students at Stanford, not just MBAs, other students, uh, the basics of finance and how to think about, uh, about that. Uh, coming down uh, the stairs, basically, uh, of the tower, uh, going, getting lower and lower and lower into the ground and looking at what was being said and eventually turning some stones as well. Uh, and it was not pretty uh, what I saw down there because um, there seemed to be a lot of uh, confusions and myths and flawed things that people say, and they seem to get away with them. Um, so the Banker's New Clothes in the title uh, actually refers to a collection of uh, flawed claims that people make and seem actually to succeed uh, in uh, somehow affecting policy. And uh, some nonsense in the world don't matter very much if people believe them, but these nonsense do matter. And so it actually becomes important to straighten this out. Um, and so after I realized about the nonsense, um, I wrote uh, a few pieces and a lot of policy papers and op-eds and other things about uh, that, trying to impact uh, the debate. And then I discovered some other things that were a little bit more disturbing, which at first, I didn't think of myself as very naive, but uh, it turns out um, it's um, not, it gets uglier and uglier as you come uh, into this. Uh, some things uh, people might know or not know, and you know, it's hard to blame people for not knowing things, but there are a lot of things that they don't want to know, and they prefer uh, to tell another story uh, about them. So everybody had their narratives and their story, and it worked for them to be uh, convinced of that, or at least to behave as if they know it to be true. And different narratives gave rise to different conclusions about what to do. For example, you could have a story in which, uh, you know, a financial crisis is similar to an earthquake and it's just stuff happens and, uh, and then, you know, you just have to prepare for a disaster and prepare the ambulances and have a disaster plan. And maybe that's the, that's the story. Um, and some of these narratives, you know, it's just a big run and a liquidity problem and all these things, uh, just a plumbing problem they want you to believe, uh, is uh, sort of leads to one set of conclusions. Oh, we saved the system and it could have been worse otherwise, and that's the end of the story. Where the narratives end up being pretty convenient for those who have them because then they don't have to look back at why we got 
uh, to be in that place in the first place, um, why the system had so much vulnerability, um, how the risks built up, and how they won't get built up again. And so the narratives got all mixed and the remedies got to be a mess. So in this country, and we can discuss this later, we had a, a huge bill co called the Dodd-Frank Act. If you were to try to follow that, you will see that the implementation of this law is nowhere, nowhere good. It's a mess, basically. Most of it has not been implemented, but it's not the point about it. The point about it was that the Dodd-Frank Act gave more authority to regulators to do more and more things that, including many of the things they could do all along, and a few more new things that could be useful. The problem is that the regulators were ineffective before, and they now have more power to do everything they need except for the one problem that they're not doing it. Um, so that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, it's not enough to have uh, the authority to do something. So, uh, so it kind of left out that, that piece about actually doing something that, that should be done and creating good regulations. And because uh, some narratives, of course, are that you don't need much regulation, the markets work. Uh, and those are completely uh, flawed. And also, ha some people have a bias that um, you know, markets tend to self-correct, or what we see must be efficient. And that includes many academics, too. So there's a facet to it that's not much in the book which uh, has to do with academics just coming into, the, into it with a certain presumption and, uh, and then just making up uh, a, a world uh, that is pretty on a piece of paper but is not quite exactly uh, what is going on out there. So what is wrong with banking? So there was basically this banker's new clothes. In other words, people were saying things and they were implying that they were all very complicated and hard and, and all of that, and it was a lock. After a year of, of trying to, or more than a year of trying to uh, talk to people, go to any conferences, write op-eds, write policy comments, uh, post comments, engage with people, there was just no no way this was going to impact the policy because those who were involved just did not want to hear it. And some people told me uh, multiple times along the way that you know the, some of the people, again, saying the things they were saying just didn't understand some basic stuff. This was pretty shocking to me because some of the things that were being said would fail these people in basic courses that I teach, and they were supposed to know this stuff. So we're talking bread and butter type of issues. Um, of course, there are others that opine, journalists, politicians, other people, and they may actually just not have the background to understand what's being said, actually. And the jargon is very confusing, too, so that doesn't help either. Okay, so what's wrong with banking? Well, one of the main things that's wrong, and we, of course, that's what the book is about, so we won't have much time to go over everything. One of the things that's wrong with banking is very, very simple. The banks borrow too much. It's a very simple thing because when the banks to fail for companies is to fail to pay your debts, that's what the failure amounts to. Lots of companies fail, uh, and oftentimes when they fail, it does involve that they you know, couldn't pay their suppliers or they couldn't make enough money to survive, and that obviously happened here in Silicon Valley. Uh, internet bubble burst and all of that. Somehow, even though in the internet bubble there was a huge loss, paper loss, people lost a lot, of, a lot of value of the pieces of paper that they had or the businesses crumbled, there wasn't a global financial crisis from that, even though there was much more of an actual loss than the loss in value in housing that accompanied the financial crisis. Why was there a global financial crisis, as we explained, it had a lot to do with a very fragile system that involved a lot of debts all over. Debt not being paid, as we see, at the housing level, at the corporate level, at the bank level, involves a legal problem. And when a lot of highly indebted institutions are linked together in a really interconnected system, then you get that systemic risk thing, which just basically is like 
a set of dominoes standing right next to one another, just very fragile. You touch and it just crumbles. And then moreover, it takes with it lots of other things in the real economy. So the banks fail and then they fail to function. And a lot of this, a huge amount of this, and not the reason that it fails, and the reason that this is so damaging, and therefore the reason that we then prop it up and save it and bail it out however we hate it, because it would be worse otherwise, is because of too much borrowing. Because too much borrowing fundamentally creates a huge problem and a huge amount of inefficiencies. When somebody borrows a lot, somebody, I mean a corporation, meaning that the investments are funded by borrowed money, making legal promises to pay later, as opposed to by the owner's money, by the shareholder's money, by retaining the profits, which is sort of how the shareholder or the owner will get more equity, just like you get more equity in your house as it goes up in value or as you invest in it. When a corporation borrows as much as the banks do, and we're talking about more than 90%, more than 95% sometimes. In other words, take borrowed money and invest it in something risky. Well, when you take money with borrowed money, when you take risk with borrowed money and you can't pay it, the borrower loses, but so do the creditors. And that creates a big conflict of interest between borrower and a creditor. And this is the big original sin in banking forever. Banks are always conflicted with their creditors over how much more they borrow, what risk they take. There's always a bias for the banker against putting their own money at risk in favor of putting some more risk on the creditors. Creditors, who are they? That's all of us. We're creditors of the banks. We give banks deposit, money. They owe it back to us. That's their debt. We put money in money market funds, the money market funds lend to the banks. They became another part of the chain through an attempt to over to basically evade regulations back in the 70s, for some of you who may have been there. At the time, interest rates were very high, but the banks were not allowed to pay interest, and so the money market started as a way to give people a way to get essentially banking with a lot of interest without, uh, without the regulation that restricted the interest. In any case, the system has become very, very uh, complicated, very interconnected, and within it having a lot of borrowing and a lot more creative ways to borrow because now we have derivatives and we have all kinds of other innovations that allowed more risk to be taken. It, they do allow risk to be hedged and circulated and spread out. All of that is good. Uh, but Along with that come other things that one can do depending on one's incentives. Now, when a lot of banks failed in the Depression, uh, we established uh, deposit insurance. The background for that goes back to, in the history of banking, and what's interesting because of the recommendations I'm going to make, banks in the 19th century had were, li were partnerships with Owners who were un, had unlimited liability, if the bank couldn't pay, the owner had to pay out of their own assets. And they were small and had about 50% equity. Then going into the 20th century and in, in, in a banking crisis in, uh, in Glasgow in the, the 1870 or something like that, had the shareholders lose everything they had, but not the depositors because the shareholders were the owners were actually personally liable. Going into the 20th century, even in the US, you had banks whose owners or shareholders could lose more than they invested. They didn't have limited liability. They could lose as much as they put in or triple or they had unlimited liability. In the depression, many bank shareholders actually went into personal bankruptcy because they couldn't cover the bank's loans. And so it didn't, at the bank's uh, debts, it didn't, help because uh, many banks still failed uh, in, in the Depression, and it was decided because some depositor runs are very inefficient, could be self-fulfilling, maybe uh, start with rumors or whatever, um, 
to, to establish FDIC deposit insurance and therefore give depositors a peace of mind that deposits up to a certain amount are insured. So the guaranteeing was meant to include, to uh, get stability and, and a system that people can trust. Because the government was behind the deposit insurance, but they were paying, uh, are paying some premium. Whether it's a fair premium or not, it's not clear. From that point on, of course, uh, there's a conflict uh, between the banks and the deposit insurance. Just like in insurance in general, the risk uh, on the upside goes to the bank and on the downside on deposit insurance. So deposit insurance requires that you start controlling uh, that the banks would be able to absorb their own losses without needing insurance, that they will have some more self-insurance. What self-insurance? Equity funding, retained earnings, and, uh, and shareholders, just like companies around here, fund all the time. Apple doesn't borrow at all, just funds all equity. So uh, over the years, uh, the banks got used to having very, very little equity. And they will tell you now that this is how they have to be. It's a debt business. they got to be highly indebted. Highly indebted in a way that you don't find anywhere in the economy. And anywhere else in the economy, we don't regulate. We don't tell people how much to borrow. They see how hard it becomes to borrow, especially for corporations, relative to just retaining their earnings. The best source of, of money for corporations is retained earnings. At least the one when we, when we teach the pecking order of funding, retained earnings, the easiest thing because you don't have to go to outside investors at all, not for debt, not for equity. Uh, not so for the banks. They just love living on the edge. But there's a problem with that. They become inefficient and they endanger other people. Otherwise, creditors would sort of start worrying more and the bank's creditors are not normal creditors. They're either insured deposits or they have thousands of ways to convince their depositors to agree to give them money. And so what you have is a certain phenomenon of uh, sort of addiction to borrowing, which comes with heavy borrowing. The borrower basically, at that point that they got heavily indebted, doesn't want to continue borrowing if the previous creditors would allow it. And a safety net for banks, implicit, explicit, uh, different one, that uh, feeds this addiction, basically. So what you have is high indebtedness that is harmful to the system. Think pollution. In other words, a source of funding that pollutes the system and harms the economy, yet it is encouraged, even subsidized. The tax code even subsidizes it, a crazy system in which we subsidize pollution when there is a clean alternative. We don't want to stop the banks from taking deposits and giving us ways to pay our bills and all of that. But that does not say that when they take our money and they go play with it, that they can take the upside and somebody else can take the downside. Otherwise, we don't care about risk. In Silicon Valley, people take risk, more risk than the banks take in innovations that often fail. But they don't do it with so much borrowed money. And even if they did, they would fail on their own and wouldn't harm others other than their investors, usually. So most defaults are, can be costly, and somebody's got to bear those costs, and there's a lot of you know, deadweight waste costs in, in legal defaults. But most many corporations live healthy without coming near any kind of indebtedness of the banks. And the banks themselves, if you think of it, wouldn't, if they're prudent anyway, wouldn't lend to a corporation, especially a corporation that has less than 25% equity. Yet, regulations proposed regulations that the banks complain about allow them to borrow up to 97% of their assets. They'll say, oh, they're very rough, they're very harsh, 7%. This is a single digit. They don't have the number, right number of digits. Uh, 7%, but that's not really 7%. It's 7% 7 of something called risk-weighted assets. Now, you don't have to understand this. We do explain this in the book. But what that says, basically, is that some of what the banks have is considered perfectly safe. They can fund that entirely with borrowed money. A great example of that is Cyprus. What happened in Cyprus? This all happened. This and J.P. Morgan Chase all happened after the book was done. What happened in Cyprus? Cyprus banks wanted to be successful in the global economy and uh, attract all kinds of money, 
never mind the tax code and other things that they made attractive, but they also made uh, it attractive to investors by promising 4 to 5 percent interest to deposits. This is a very high interest. This is much more than German banks were paying. Their depositors was under 1 percent. Interest rates are very low right now in Europe. But the Cyprus banks uh, promised a lot. Now, you cannot get 4 to 5 percent without taking risk. It just doesn't work that way. And so they had a way to get paid. They turned around and uh, thanked Greece for convincing the Eurozone to include uh, it in the Euro and lent to the Greek government. And the Greek government, which was heavily indebted by 2008, 9, 10, um, was promising 15, 20 percent. And why was Cyprus, uh, Greece paying so much in interest? Well, just like credit card debt is, debt is expensive because some people don't pay and Greece was considered uh, a risky um, borrower and therefore had to pay uh, promise a lot because there was a chance it won't pay. Sure enough, despite the Cyprus banks passing a so-called stress test run by the European uh, Central Bank and by the European Banking Association in the summer of 2011, months after that, not many months after that, uh, in early 2012, they faced uh, something that was being discussed for a long time, but the stressful scenario, alas, was not as stressful as it turned out to be, whoops, 75% um, they had to take as a loss on this. They had to basically write off more than half the debt and accept something less valuable for the other. And oops, they lost 75% on their investment in Greek bonds. And now these same Cyprus banks, which, so j just in terms of the regulation, the Cyprus banks investing in Greek debt, that was considered like putting money under the mattress for them, according to the regulation. The regulation views all government debt within the Eurozone, for Eurozone banks, as perfectly safe. So they don't need any, they don't have any need to imagine that they might lose on that. They can just fund that with the same deposit money on which they promised 4% or 5%. Isn't that a great investment? We can all be bankers this way. We take money at 4% and we invest it at 15%. That's just a little bit of an intense version of the so-called 363 banking that used to uh, pervade in the, in the 60s where 363 stood for you pay your depositors 3%, you charge your borrowers 6% and you get to the golf course by 3 p.m. That was 363 banking when it was born. Uh, and that was the life of the banker. So now you get a little more exciting, and, uh, and now you, you go for higher returns, and you play a little harder, and uh, higher returns usually come with higher risk. And so, sure enough, that's what happened. Now, when, the, when uh, Greece uh, defaulted in this way, uh, there wasn't much uh, there in the Cyprus banks to absorb that. And they basically became underwater, just like a homeowner whose house uh, becomes uh, less valuable than the mortgage. And, uh, but they had to keep paying. And so for a while, they were being fed by the European Central Banks in what's called liquidity support. They always call it that way. Uh, and, uh, and until they got tired of that and said that uh, something has to happen and these losses uh, uh, have to be uh, borne by somebody and these banks really were broken. And uh, then, of course, it was the whole fiasco that many of you remember from a few weeks ago where um, at first they said that all depositors would get a uh, sort of so-called haircut tax, whatever they call it. You'd find that you have... 6.75% less money in your bank. By the way, they would have still made more than the German would have made, even with the 6.75% from 2008 to that point. So these banks still paid over the, that period uh, pretty well, 4 to 5% a year uh, to the small depositors. But of course, small depositors are insured, supposedly, so that was that. So now, of course, the bigger depositors, and of course, now they have to stop them from taking the money out, and now they might lose 60%, and uh, even with that, somebody else in the Eurozone or in IMF or somewhere else will still have to cover that. 
So what kind of a system was that? All along, while it was a big party, and they were making 11% as if for free, uh, nobody wanted to look at it, not the politicians, not the regulators, that this is too good to be true. In the rest of finance, when I tell my students that you can take money without investing any of your own and get more for it, for sure, we have a word for it in finance called arbitrage opportunity. I tell my students they don't exist. This is a money machine. But bankers think that they're entitled to these kinds of money machines, and they often actually have access to them, it appears. So at least to a point, and that other people don't, but somehow uh, that seems to work. Anyway, the regulations have such phenomena. Triple A mortgage securities are considered riskless, and a lot of banks failed on these riskless things. Okay, so we explain in the book all of that, um, and what to do about it is very simple. Reduce their indebtedness. Whatever else you do, reduce their indebtedness, because one of the ways in which they get subsidies is that they get to borrow at below market rates and with conditions that other borrowers in their position uh, wouldn't have been able to borrow, wouldn't be able to borrow in their real economy. Bring their funding costs to the real world as opposed to their desired subsidized world. And so people talk about reducing those subsidies. Those subsidies exist. The banks would deny them. That's false. Even the credit rating agencies agree that uh, they give them credit notches, uplifts, whatever, because they're banks and are likely to get support. We discuss in the book the many ways in which uh, their creditors or, or believe that they will be paid and that they won't have to bear bankruptcy costs or other things that are relevant for other companies and therefore agree to give them money, which other companies are not in a position to, to get. Uh, how to do it? It's, we give the precise prescription and we also say to do it now. So a lot of what you'll hear, this is a narrative that, oh, the economy is suffering, we can't do it now. Um, we have to wait. Well, first of all, we've waited four and a half years. Europe actually is in a miserable, miserable shape, in large part because of their banks. It, they have other problems, but their banks have not ever gotten any better, and they're dragging down the rest of the economy. Sick banks are very bad for the economy. Are our banks healthy? A lot less than what they'll have you believe. A lot less. Because they have all kinds of ways to hide their losses. They have actually reasons not to negotiate mortgages, only to appear better. Because if they don't negotiate that second mortgage, they don't have to write it off and admit that they lost everything on the second mortgage and will never be paid. Uh, so a lot of people are suffering so that the banks can appear stronger than they are, and then they go through charades of stress tests and other things, only to allow the banks to continue to uh, make payouts to their shareholders. This is among the biggest mistakes that were made before the crisis and the most obvious mistakes. In the summer of 2007, it was very clear that um, there were problems in subprime mortgage markets. There were a lot of bad loans that were made. Housing prices made, started declining. It was pretty clear the writing was on the wall. Something bad was about to happen in the housing market. What do you do to the banks? First and foremost, you make them not deplete their ability to absorb losses so that they can continue to lend in the downturn. Instead, they paid out through the financial crisis as the government was investing in the banks. They continued to pay dividends, sometimes very large dividends. About half of the amount of money that was invested in the largest banks actually got paid out during that time between summer 2007 and early 2009, in which, at which time the government realized that they would look awfully stupid if they lost money on these banks' investment. And the investment they had in the banks, in TARP, so-called, was one of what's called preferred. In other words, they became essentially creditors of the banks. They told the banks they had to owe them something, and uh, which well, didn't help lending. That's a whole other thing, because the banks still didn't want to lend anyway, and there's a lot of evidence tomorrow you hear from the, from the uh, TARP uh, inspector general as well. And um, they said, pay us first, and then you can 
resume your salaries and you can resume your pay, payout, but we'll run stress tests. It's in Dodd-Frank, we'll run stress tests. And so they so reduced their dividends for a little while, but as soon as they could, they paid off the government and here we go again. We're doing the same things. 2006, the banks looked good. When the, as we explain in the books, when you uh, do a little bit well with borrowed money, then you do really well as a borrower because borrowing has this way of magnifying the upside as it makes the risk on the downside also magnified and imposes risk on the creditors. Anyway, there are very straightforward ways to strengthen the system now. First and foremost, recognize zombie banks, sick banks that are not viable, that could persist for a long time. Those of you who are around in savings and loan know that allowing sick banks to stay only keeps around dysfunctional, potentially reckless banks. Japan has lived with sick banks for a long, long time, and Europe is now having a lot of zombie banks in Spain, in probably France, other places, which are not functioning, but nobody wants to recognize it. Everybody's scared of admitting, of facing reality. This is very bad because evidence shows that postponing problems is only bad. In this country, we're not as bad as Europe. Lucky us. Europe is not a good example. We should not strive to be as bad as Europe. When, uh, so when people say, you know, we can't compete with the European banks, uh, I say, well, let them win if that's what they want to do over there. Um, let them risk their own taxpayers. I feel for their taxpayers that their governments uh, are so bad about it. Our government's pretty bad too. So uh, we have our own politics and the bankers own the place, as Senator Durbin said in 2009, still own the place. So they've confused a lot of policymakers. They make a lot of threats that we debunk in the book one by one. And the reason this book was written um, for the public, because without public pre pressure, this is not going to change, was our conclusion. So what are we going to do? We can keep talking to these people. They don't want to hear. It's a wall. So political pressure has to come, and teaching has to come. So without judging why people say what they say, at least we will elevate the debate beyond the land of nonsense so that people know that when we talk about equity funding as opposed to borrowed money, we're not talking about cash reserves. Cash reserves, a pile of money, a rainy day fund, that's not the same. When you have a down payment in the house or equity invested, it's not sitting aside. It's not, we are not holding it. They always say banks hold capital. They use the word capital for equity to confuse everybody as if it's something that the banks are investing in. I'm sure I usually get dragged out of situations of this sort. You just push my button and I go. So, uh, so I will stop any time you tell me, uh, well, moderator. This is a good but time to stop. We have a lot of really good questions. Yeah, so, so let uh, me start engaging. I'd be happy to engage. Okay, well then, thank you very much for those remarks, and um, let's start, we, please have a seat, and yes. we'll, we'll start with the questions. Um, uh, there are uh, several themes in the questions, and I'd, I'd like to sort of start with, um, you know, there were things that the government did throughout the 20th century that led to some of the problems, and we're talking really about the United States, and a little bit later I'll talk about other places, but, um, you know, uh, Several questions re revolve around Glass-Steagall, which was a Depression-era law passed to separate commercial banking from uh, the investment banking and some of the casino activities that you're talking about that are dangerous with other people's money. Um, I, I uh, was looking at, you know, what was the impetus behind removing Glass-Steagall in 1999, which was uh, in some ways um, uh, a, a precipitator of some of these problems. So could you comment on uh, the role that Glass-Steagall and its removal played? And, you know, one observation that uh, one of the listeners made is that um, if there was high capital ratios and separation before that, that law, why uh, didn't that prevent some of these problems? Well, we had a lot of discussion about Glass-Steagall because my co-author is from Germany, I didn't talk much about him, but I have a co-author named Martin Helwig, uh, and he is uh, in Bonn, and he's very uh, scathing about his own country. So uh, we have some stuff on, uh, on London's banks in which he says uh, these are so political banks. He loves this line. I said, are you sure you want to have it in the book? Yes. The line is that the ability to make a phone call and make the politician do uh, what you think they should do with the money is worth every euro of taxpayer money to the politician. Uh, so the Landis Banks are very inefficient. 
back to your question, Glass-Steagall. Well, Martin claims, my co-author, that the Americans are too nostalgic and are connecting things that are not as connected. Because in his country, there were, even though there's effectively a Glass-Steagall, there was never like, an official separation uh, of this sort. Glass-Steagall, so, so a couple of things. First of all, the period that people like to call the quiet period, which happened to be after Glass-Steagall, so the 1940 to 1970, which people are the sort of good old days, a number of things made that period quiet, and some of them had nothing to do with how good the banks actually were, although it is true that they were more boring and there was less. But part of the reason this period was quiet was because it was just quiet in other places in the economy. There wasn't any downturn in housing. There wasn't a lot of uncertainty about interest rates yet. There wasn't uncertainty about exchange rates yet. So the economy was in a sort of this quiet period in terms of sort of overall volatility, overall sort of uncertainty. And so a lot of things changed in, in, in the 80s. The Glass-Steagall Act was actually eroded so much by the time that it was repealed that it wasn't clear what was actually left of it because there was so much already interconnectedness in this. We already had money market funds. We already had the, the commercial banks investing in the, invest, uh, in, in the investment banks. So the, the, the banks in, in, in the countries were giving money to the money center banks all the time. So the money was still moving through this system and so it was still going from the depositors in the country to the to 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 the investment banks uh, through their banks. So uh, capital requirements were not high at that time. This was Basel was is a new invention and capital requirements, everything was very regional. So Basel was an attempt actually to get at the Japanese at the time uh, with trying to coordinate that. So it was all, you know, there was a Prompt corrective action. There, there was the regulation by the FDIC and other bodies, and and but it's hard to know why it was quiet. Whether it was a luck or or kind of the, something good about the system. There is a lot of nostalgia about Glass Steagall. Our view is that for, uh, we do have to remember in all this that the banks that failed the most were actually would have, were investment banks that did not take deposits. So it was Lehman and Bear Stearns that were that caused, the, the, were considered systemic anyway, and one of them we saw fail and didn't like what, what happened after that. So it's not clear. Our position is that no matter what you do, because the system is so interconnected, you have to reduce the leverage, the indebtedness dramatically in the system. And our the advantage we see in separation is that actually you could put a higher equity requirement on the non-deposit taking institutions that can scale up their risks to derivative markets and do all these all these things. So my short answer is it's a little more complicated than that. That the nostalgia for Glass-Steagall is, it's hard to, re, the, a modern era Glass-Steagall is just hard to, to actually think about how to do exactly because of the ways that they kind of interact with one another and there's a lot of inter-system borrowing and lending. Well, you mentioned there uh, Basel and that, that framework, which is an international framework for banks. And um, maybe you could comment a little bit upon there was Basel 1, 2, and 3. And, and even in Basel 3 in your book, you talk about how it's too slow to ramp up and too low of a requirement. It's still only 3%. One of the questions I got is, what do you recommend as a capital uh, requirement in banking? Um, and, uh, you know, th you mentioned in the talk that only uh, you know, banks can get away with 3% equity. The only other borrowers I know that do that um, are home borrowers who borrow from the FHA, another government-backed uh, form of lending. And the only people who will lend at, you know, 97% loan to value is, un well, is taxpayers who don't know they're doing it. Uh, so could you comment about just uh, capital requirements? And you, you do talk about this very well in the book, but just... Um yes. So uh, Basel is, is an attempt to is a place where they get together and try to come up with sort of minimal capital requirements. They're meant to be minimal. Some people forget that. Michel Barnier seems to forget that. Uh, the guy from Brussels uh, who seems to want maximum harmonization as if he cares that somebody else tries to protect themselves against their excessive risk in their banking. Uh, Basel uh, three has multiple flaws. Basel two was considered scientific and good only to fail miserably. And the system that it 
created, this risk weight system, all the science behind it, only proved counterproductive. So my co-author Martin was uh, thought that risk weights made sense, but he's gotten completely disillusioned with them and thinks they're extremely uh, counterproductive. So what we recommend, uh, we don't want to be scientific about it. What we say is that there's an illusion of precision there. Think of it like speed limits. You want to be safe and crude uh, because the science is a complete illusion there in terms of the measurements of the risk, and a lot of the risks that they actually take are not even included in all of that. So the levels that we're talking about, and we're very skeptical about exactly who puts the numbers, so there has to be a lot of caveats on that, is sort of we would like the banks to be living in the space, moving around, because the equity is supposed to absorb losses between 20 and 30 percent of their total investment, numbers that are, were common before all the safety nets, and numbers that are completely minimal in general in the economy without any regulation. They will consider you crazy if you mention such numbers, but if they, banks have to shrink as a result, that might be just a good thing anyway. So uh, by doing so, if you reduce subsidies that we want to take away anyway, that's only good. That's, that's a feature, not a bug. So, uh, so, so we would do just about anything you can think about. It would do a good thing because it would just correct distortions. So if the banks have to bear more of their downside, that would only be a way to correct the situation in which they can pass it on to other people. So the other issue is, of course, what's on a balance sheet. This is 20% of what? Who measures those numbers? And there's like accounting problems that we try to not talk too much about, but just give the general flavor. A lot of end notes. You don't have to read them. Uh, but there's an issue of how you do the derivative accounting, and we explain a little bit of that. If you do the derivative accounting differently, J.P. Morgan Chase, as we show in the book, is over $4 trillion dollars. Four trillion dollars that do not exist. Corporations like this in the whole world. Did you know that the top 80 corporations in the world are all financial institutions by size of assets? So they are the largest in the world. Um, anyway, so that's basically the number. Between 20 and 30 percent, we would have uh, the equity deplete, but then conserve it and build it up. Tell the banks to raise equity. They have access to the same investors that other companies must go to, to their own investors, their own shareholders, to uh, new shareholders, new investors. If they have a good business, they should be able to raise equity. If they cannot, at any price, not at a price they like, at a price, any price, that's a big flag. They might be too opaque. We don't know what's going on. We saw Wells Fargo Bank. We don't know what's going on. And they should worry more about how to make their investors like them than how to yell at the regulators to allow them to keep borrowing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we've talked about a few uh, sort of government-related concepts, Glass-Steagall and Basel, and uh, there's some questions about the Fed. And one of the questions uh, is that uh, someone has looked at the Fed's balance sheet and said that they have $3.25 trillion in assets. Uh, those would be loans, and only $55 billion in equity, um, and that implies a capital ratio of only 1.7 percent. How do you apply your theory to the Federal Reserve? Well, we talk a little bit about central banks, uh, but balance sheets of central banks are kind of not real balance sheets, because uh, in fact, actually, central banks have a monopoly over printing money. They sometimes do it in various other ways, but that's not like real money. So these balance sheets are a little bit different to talk about, and this is, this is all kind of not the same meaning as, as, as others, but it is true what's being pointed out, that the Fed has taken a lot of assets into its own possession uh, in this course of uh, trying to help the banks. Yeah. And in, in today's world, unlike 100 years ago, they don't have to waste ink or paper to create money. That's uh, even more efficient than it used That's to right. be. Um, so uh, the, uh, the other things about regulators, uh, it was mentioned in your talk that um, the regulators were not enforcing the laws on the books, and that uh, why not, and, and is there oversight um, of monitoring the regulators? Yes, there is a problem with the regulators. Uh, the regulators seem to be very timid. They have, were timid. In fact, Basel has a what they call um, they, um, 
they have a principle by which the regulators can actually, pillar two, by which the regulators can actually interfere in anything that seems somehow not prudent. And there was a lot that was going on in terms of banks guaranteeing all kinds of entities off their balance sheet, these special purpose vehicles and all these things that they were doing were commitments they were making, they were increasing risk, and then somehow they were allowed to ignore that. Or the regulators failed to trace the risks through the system. So to monitor carefully the fact that the banks were telling them that certain risk was gone uh, because they bought a credit default swap and insurance basically on the credit uh, from AIG. But when AIG took on so much of the credit risk of everybody in the system, and that credit risk was not very good risk, uh, then AIG became a systemic company, and all of a sudden we had to bail AIG out. And so the regulators in all of this are agreeing, therefore, that the risk is gone, and in that way failing to, to trace uh, the buildup of the risk and to monitor the risk-taking uh, of these banks and we saw in Lehman also all kinds of tricks to, accounting tricks and other tricks to, to hide uh, the indebtedness and, and appear better. And so regulators are, have not been very vigilant and they often give you the excuse that they can't regulate because activities will move to the so-called shadow banking system. That's always a concern they have. We uh, mock this perverse reason not to regulate, uh, which basically says because we have been incapable of effectively regulating and enforcing this regulation, therefore we can't regulate. We might as well therefore give up. Our analogy is, uh, is uh, allowing robbery because the robbers uh, are in the uh, lighted streets and the uh, and the robbers go to the dark street, but the police is only in the lighted street. And so do we allow robbery for that reason? We tell the police to go to the light, dark street too. So, uh, and similarly, just because people find tax loopholes, we don't stop collecting taxes. So those are just defeatist reasons. If we don't face up to the enforcement challenge, then we're doomed. Uh, then we forever will be tricked by, uh, by these banks. You saw in London Whale, by the way, the meekness of these regulators. Jamie Dimon tells them, oh, you don't need to know this. Carl Levin in their hearing pro prods more than regulators who have perfect ability to, uh, to ask hard questions when something doesn't look right. They seem helpless somehow, and the banks seem to uh, be able to get away with too much. So, you know, think... Uh, what, think teenager kids or what? <laughs> well, you know, this kind of leads to the other, uh, another topic of questions relating to government, which is following the whole crisis, there was the uh, efforts to try to address the weaknesses. Um, and here we had the Dodd-Frank um, uh, legislation, mm -hmm. and uh, it spawned a whole lot of other things that are still being created. But I wonder if you could comment about, uh, well, there's things that were in place before, like the FDIC, and they've changed some of their policies. And then there's new things like the Consumer um, CFPB, uh, which- Financial is Protection been, Bureau. Yeah, which is to protect consumers from um, financial abuses. And could you comment about what you think is, is gonna come about in the prognosis for these things? Well, there are different pieces. So they, they did create, they eliminated just one regulator that was like the worst of all the bunch of them. Uh, this Office of Thrift Supervision was eliminated. Uh, but they created a, a few new bodies. One of them is this uh, Consumer Protection Agency because, in fact, the Fed had authority to kind of maybe regulate or supervise at least uh, you know, lending terms or uh, of the sort. And there was just a lot of abuse there as we know, and so I guess Elizabeth Warren argued that we know more about toasters than about, uh, about financial contracts. And when I teach, I sometimes do a, a little case about should you pay cash for a car and sort of look at the disclosures uh, of, of interests and other things like that. So consumer protection is generally uh, a, a good thing. More information, making sure that inf consumers get information or that they're not taken advantage of is a good thing. So this just applies to, to, to uh, financial transactions, which people actually can be more, maybe more easily taken advantage of or something like that. So that's kind of in that space. 
that's a little bit less in my view about sort of financial stability. My focus is on, on sort of can we have a financial system, a banking system that kind of, you know, fits as a normal, healthy part of the economy as opposed to as this bloated, dangerous monster in the economy. Uh, in that context, they did a few things and created new, new uh, scenarios and new bodies. And they also supposedly are going back to try to regulate the derivatives. However, very alarmingly, the Congress is now weakening some of the, these provisions, this so-called, I think, Title VII. Of, there's lots of different titles to this act. In financial stability, uh, I mentioned they have the FDIC now being able to resolve or provide an alternative to bankruptcy for any company. So it could have done Lehman in principle instead of bankruptcy courts. It can do Bank of America today if they chose to declare that it's insolvent or that it's an imminent default. There's an issue about the trigger. The other thing they created was something like called FSOC and OFR. There are lots of acronyms. FSOC is Financial Stability Oversight committee or council, and OFR is the Office of Financial Research. Unfortunately, they have not been doing very much that I can see. Uh, FSOC has declared a few financial firms utility, financial utilities, which I guess gives them some other um, regulation, but they were supposed to define who is systemic, and they've been unable to do that. Meanwhile, the SEC, which was charged with regulating money market funds, has failed to do that, and FSOC pointed a finger and said, do something about this, and any day now, five years later, they might actually do something about money market funds, uh, which is uh, outrageous that, they, that nobody does anything about. So, in short, a lot of things are in this really slow, tedious process of implementation, which involves them something called rules making. I didn't know anything about this until a couple of years ago, but now I, I, now I know a little more than I want to know. But you, you know, they submit a proposal, and then it's open for comments, and then they get 1,500 comments from interested parties, and then they get a politicians yelling at them to read every one of them and respond, on and on and on. Well, it seems like what what I the message that both your book and your talk have been giving is that these uh, regulators and overseers have been, for whatever reason uh, or reasons, captured by the banks themselves, and 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 so every effort to try to rein in some of these problems is is thwarted. Um, and it seems that your view is that by educating people, which your book does and starts with, you know, the basics of of how banks run and what banks do and leverage and all of that, it, it, it seems like your, your remedy is to teach the broader uh, world about this phenomenon so that they can demand more from our government. Is that? I personally didn't know how to change it, uh, except for that. Uh, so to the extent that some people were well-meaning, even among, the, among policymakers, and just got confused or just were told it's too hard and you don't understand this is the way it's got to be, uh, that at least they will be able to counter uh, that, or even commentators uh, will just sort of get what we're talking about and get what the economics of it is. And then the public, it uh, seems like there's some uh, possibility anyway that, uh, that public pressure can get uh, some results done before. Otherwise, I was told when I got into this that I'll be in great shape for the next crisis. I can say, didn't I tell you to do this and that? And then I'll, yeah. be, I'll be in good shape. So basically, other industries have, there's a lot of talk about money politics and about, you know, Republic lost and all of that. Uh, the banking industry gets away with more than others, partly because the risks in banking are very abstract. So we're not talking about planes falling from the sky where the public will not tolerate uh, unsafety. These are very abstract risks. There's always some stories you tell. Accountability is very difficult to establish. So if you didn't regulate derivatives you know, way back and you allowed some risk to slip, you know, it's just hard to trace it back. So there's no accountability throughout yeah. this, all the way to mm -hmm. the politicians whose terms are, uh, and then they just hope the crisis won't happen on their watch or it'll be some other story, or rather that they don't, it's not them. Now, we, we've t focused uh, pretty much on the United States in this uh, so far, and I'd like to just sort of look beyond and, and ask, um, are there places where you think they really do banking right? Uh, 
uh, well, problems in banking are uh, sort of endemic a little bit to banking. Uh, as in one example of a place that faced the, faced the financial crisis or banking crisis better, we actually bring up Sweden in the early 90s as an example of a country that was not afraid to look the crisis in the eye to uh, sort of take over briefly the sick banks and sort of bring back into private markets healthier banks as opposed to uh, meddle and, and let them kind of just just uh, nurse them back slowly to life, uh, like the kind of typical approach, deny, postpone, all of that. So that can be done, and I think uh, relatively, you know, Sweden, Switzerland, UK, uh, that were kind of most enlightened, at least in Basel regulation. Unfortunately, the politics in a place like, uh, like Germany and France with respect to banks is... Um, and many other countries, of course, uh, is, is bad. Nowadays, Iceland has seen the light and is recovering from, uh, from its incident in which uh, it allowed the banks to take over. So right now, I think there are serious attempts, first of all, to get out of the mess that we are in and maybe get to a better place, but it's pretty overwhelming everywhere in terms of the same types of, of confusions and captures and symbiosis between governments and banks. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty daunting. You, you cite three countries with their own currencies as good uh, banking countries. And that, I wonder if there's a connection. Uh, you know, Germany and France you use as counterexamples um, are in the euro. And so is there... Uh, is there, well, one question is, is there a future for the euro? I got that oh, one Oh, well, that, that, one, that one, I don't think we have enough time, but that, that's a very complicated question. Uh, that, <laughs> that's very complicated. I don't think that the, the, the political problems in terms of uh, Germany, France and, the, France and their banks uh, are related directly to the euro. Uh, so I think that that's, that's a coincidence. But it is true that the countries have more flexibility uh, about a number of things uh, when, when they have, when they have their, their own currency in Europe right now they're talking one of their problems among the many problems of the euro zone and and the and and uh and european union but more so the euro zone is is the split in banking as well as in the the fisc in uh, their budgets and everything you know there's a political split and the banking split and so you get the situation where they have one central bank, the central bank can support banks, but the banks are in different countries, supervised by different people. Uh, and so when they try to do a, a sort of a banking union with a sort of FDIC-like resolution and other things, they get into the same political problems that they have with budgets, which is that they kind of don't want to cede authority to, to the European Central Bank or to somebody else, and so they get into these political mm -hmm. problems about that. So there is talk of, of banking union, but... Everything is much harder in Europe than it Well, on that be. subject, I, I, you know, I wonder if you think, as some people have, have said, uh, that the decision to confiscate bank deposits in Cyprus uh, and, and, and thereby making a, doll, a, a euro in a, in a Munich bank worth, worth more than a euro in a Nicosia bank, um, has that had a permanent uh, damaging effect on people's confidence in banking and well, there definitely is a, a, a problem. The euro seems to be kind of different in different countries, and there are, uh, people within the eurozone can move their money uh, to to banks uh, in, in in other countries, and the banks in Greece and even Italy and Spain uh, are suffering from uh, from some deposit flight uh, out. The, the, the Cyprus ordeal did not help. Uh, build confidence, so they can say it's a one-off, but there was uh, sort of a precedent there, even that, that discussion. Of course, the fact the fact that it was even discussed shows you just how the, the Cyprus politics was so crazy, because it was their idea to do this, to protect their business model, the sick business model of attracting all this Russian money. Uh, to, to Cyprus. So they, even with all of that, they still wanted to preserve that great banking system of theirs. Well, do of course, you foresee that's all that, that, you know, if you were uh, a Spanish uh, or French depositor and you saw that that was a solution that was also, by the way, promoted by the Germans and, yeah. and the others, so uh, you, you might be a little nervous about carrying deposits because, as you pointed out earlier, a depositor is lending money to the bank. Yes. So 
Actually, it's it's in this country uh, deposit insurance. The deposit insurance works, so there's no question about that. And deposit insurance now is up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So it was increased from a hundred thousand. And um, in European countries, in some countries, actually, they don't ha even have a clear deposit preference uh, rule. Uh, which means depositors versus other versus other creditors. It's less clear. I think in this country there is, but I think that actually uninsured depositors in IndyMac uh, did lose uh, money. So um, in any case, uh, I think that the Europeans are saying that 100,000 euro is insured, and then uh, nominally I don't think they would any more try out uh, this experiment uh, of, of trying to impose losses on, on smaller than that. Above that, the issue really becomes, can they have enough loss absorption through, through equity or long-term debt that still is they trust more than they should? In the crisis, nothing but equity absorbed losses. Everybody was promised, even though they were supposed to be converted to equity or something. It was just too complicated. They just paid everybody. So I, we, we advocate and we explain why, just the use of equity for that uh, and, and making sure that, that the investors know what they're getting into and, and then you don't have to worry about who they are and whether they can absorb losses. Otherwise, uh, deposits are just a form of debt for the bank. Mm -hmm. Um, there was one question about alternatives to banks. As credit unions, for example, are there alternatives to our banking model that you would advocate uh, or that could help addressing <laughs> systemic risk? There have been some very extreme proposals uh, along these lines. Some of them are like what's called a 100% reserve. That's basically almost, you can think of it as you give your money to the bank like you give a suitcase to the deposits or, or your coat. You know, in other words, they save your dollar bill, you know, and don't do anything with it. Uh, and then, and that completely breaks down the whole notion of, of, uh, of using deposits for, for, for any kind of investment. We don't advocate that narrow banking, 100% reserve banking. We don't, we don't think that that, that would be good because we do believe that there is a there is room for financial intermediation and there is room for to channel deposits, uh, even deposits, uh, um, and, and to, into 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 investment. What we do think that there is way way excessive production of, of sort of liquidity. Everybody wants to cut that corner. Everybody wants to have money as safe as cash that pays interest more than. The, more than should be right in this economy and somehow uh, believe that something can be uh, true that's sort of too good to be true. Um, we also, so we basically think that there is just a way to straighten out the distortion and kind of have a system that's that's doing all the good things we wanted to do without some of the bad things. Uh, alternatives, um, it, again, you could break them somewhat so that you can regulate them a little bit differently, more, more, uh, more than that. But fundamentally, any corporation and banks in particular have have a governance issue in terms of who makes decisions and and, and all of that. And you saw MF Global. You know, you need still effective regulation. You need segregation of accounts. You need all of that. Uh, fortunately, MF Global failure was not systemic, uh, although a lot of people lost money, and there was another company. That, that, level, did. That, that large trading uh, hedge, uh, operation yeah, in, in John Corzine uh, was, was running, um, that they're still trying to chase down the money that they can't find from that. Yeah. Um, it does show just how opaque these uh, derivative and uh, alternative asset type uh, uh, entities are to even know what risks they bear at any given moment in time. Yeah, so the way the banks tell it, the end investor needs these derivatives to hedge, and some of it is true. When oil prices are very volatile, the airlines want to buy buy forward and just lock the price and things like that. So some of this is fine. What we say about derivatives, and, and our, my strong belief about derivatives, is that they should really be in exchanges. I don't even like clearing houses. The clearing houses, again, it's sort of, uh, some people say it's the mother of systemic institution that's so all the risk gonna, is going to concentrate in that, and this, those are very, very, uh, could be very dangerous, uh, sort of a way to arrange the risk to actually concentrate in one place. 
but over the counter markets and some to some extent clearing houses can be can be very dangerous and very opaque and so uh, there's no reason that most derivative trading couldn't be done on exchanges uh, which are just in the broad daylight where you can sort of see exactly the trades and and who's against who and you can have good monitoring of it okay well that concludes our program for this evening. On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I ask you to join me in thanking Anat Admati for her excellent talk and discussion. Many thanks to you as well, the audience, for your terrific questions. Um, Professor Admati's book is over here, uh, available for sale, The Banker's New Clothes, uh, and um, she'll be here to, to sign uh, editions uh, after the program. So thank you and good night.